So we have, remember that the key to this, the earnings, um, you earn relative to your ability to contribute to the firm that you're working for. Now, now, remember that the contribution of labor is, I mean, for all intents and purposes, to make it easy, it's, it's really about the, like the FTEs or the, the money I generate from the state of California for me. But, but there's also, I mean, there's also contributions in, in like for a police officer for safety. There's some value on that that taxpayers are willing to pay. I mean, it, so, so the point is here, and, and we've already talked about it, but make sure you're clear, is that the, the wage that you earn is contingent on your ability to produce for the firm. And so for a doctor, that's easy. You know, they, they get 200 grand for doing a heart transplant or whatever, and that's, the, they contribute that kind of, um, they generate that kind of revenue based on their contribution, and that's, of course, what they get paid. For a police officer, it's a little bit different because it's not like they're really generating any revenue. But, but as taxpayers, you and I agree that a, a police officer is worth $50,000 worth of, of safety. Or, you know, we, we value it at that. And so his or her contribution to our community is, is $50,000. Farmer, that's easy. I mean, or a farm worker, actually, is easy because they... A farm worker, I and mean, this is just a number for as far as I'm concerned, but they contribute $20,000 to the farm that they work for. There we go, they get paid, you know, based or consummate with their uh, contribution of labor. All right, so is everybody cool with that? Um, so based on that, there are <coughs> five things that, that relegate or dedi dedicate your income or, or sort of predict what it's going to be. Um, the, the things here, compensating differentials, I'll talk about just real quick. I know we've covered it, but I want to make sure that you're clear. Human capital, ability, effort, chance, signaling, and superstars. Okay, compensating differentials was the, um, you know, that, that some jobs are dangerous, so you get paid a little bit more, or, or a lot more for that matter. Um, some jobs are cushy. Um, <laughs> I was teaching economics, you know. No. It's, not easy. <laughs> it's hard, it stresses me out. Um, <laughs> So, so some jobs are easier, and so, so even though the, the job is kind of essentially the same, a night worker tends to get paid a little bit more. And, and why is it that a night, well, you tell me, why does a night worker get paid a little bit more than a day worker for doing the exact same job? Nobody wants their incentive. It, it incentivizes them, but what is it that they're giving up that the day worker maybe isn't giving up? Sleep. Uh, and regular, a social life. A regular time when everybody else in stores are on phone when yeah. uh, TV is, uh, movies are on. Yeah, TV. TV. <laughs> the good shows are on at night, of course. Yeah. But they're no. giving up. They're giving yeah, up. no, no, you're right. Is, is that, you guys that actually time. said different examples of the exact same thing is that a night worker <coughs> gives up, you know, their opportunity costs are different. And so a day worker gives up, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know. Actually, here's here's a problem. Just as an example that I've run into is that due to my schedule, like I'm off, you know, whatever, on, on December 20th, right? I'm off, but none of my friends are off. You know what I mean? And because they're all working, so they don't they don't when they go to work, they don't give anything up because there's nothing going on because everybody else has gone to work. But for a night worker, they give up, you know, the social scene or time with their family or whatever, and so their opportunity cost is different. Yeah. Okay, so, so come seeing differentials, and then don't forget the example I gave in class about being the lifeguard. And, and um, the, the pay for being a lifeguard was, no kidding, a cheeseburger and as much Coke as you could drink. And then what did I get? What did I get for being a lifeguard? Well, the pay was nothing. But what was it all about? It was all about... The girls. Yeah, bikinis. That was what it was all about. And then, um, so, so the pay was very low, but there was this benefit of, of being around all the girls. You know, that was the point. Um, human capital is, um, is education. And there's two kinds of education. There's on-the-job training and, and, and school formal, formal training. And I think, you know, they, they say that education, and, and I think, like, academic education is what they're getting at. But education is the most valuable form of human capital. But I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think the more I think about it, they really truly go hand in hand. I think I think you get a degree, which is, I mean, it's very important. <coughs> you get the degree, and it gives you the opportunity to apply for and, and potentially get a job doing whatever. And then the job is where you really learn how to do the job. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I think I said this already, but, but in school you sort of get all these concepts and points and, you know, little experiments that don't really mean much. But then when you get to the employee, employer, then, then indeed you learn how to really do the job and you can become good at it, you know. Yes, 
But don't you think that education kind of allows you to be a little bit more teachable? Oh, no doubt. I yeah. mean, that's, that's the point is that, and that actually goes right into signaling, which is when you get a degree, like I told you about my sister, right, the architecture. Mm -hmm. She got this, she had a master's degree in architecture, but you know, the, the economy was doing well then. It was like in the, must have been about 1997, 98, somewhere in there. And, and she just couldn't find a job. And so she became a, uh, a manager at, at a, what was a place called Roland's Nursery. And it was, a, it was a decent job, but she didn't know shit about nurseries, you know? But she, she had a, a, a degree that said she had the ability to learn how to do it. <laughs> and, and she did, and she, she became, I mean, she doesn't do that anymore, but at the time, it was a pretty good job, you know, <coughs> she a pretty good amount of money. Um, so, oh, and then I, I told you guys about, this is just kind of reverting back to the exam. Um, I told you guys about, you're not texting. Oh, no. 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 Okay. Um, I told you guys about the, um, the, if you're hoping to find a good relationship, <laughs> Everybody's all like, <laughs> I'm freaking them out. Sorry about that. Um, so, so if you're looking to find good relationships, and, and I mean it's not probably super corollary, but, but the idea is that healthier relationships come from education because people who make more money have less stress in their life, so they meet people and they stay with them because they can focus on their relationships rather than worrying about how to pay the goddamn bills all the time. And so they, they can worry about, you know, being healthy in their relationship. Plus, you're more inclined to meet people like-minded, like intelligence, like interests in, in higher education, where you really kind of hone down the kind of people you're meeting, and it's not just a, you know, date.com thing anymore, you know what I mean? Um, let's see, so human capital, um, ability, effort, and chance. Um, and again, I don't want to take anything away from anybody, but, you know, you, you got what you got, and, and if... Probably if a lot of, this is really kind of touchy. I don't want to like destroy anybody's dream, you know, that's the last thing I want to do. But, you know, chances are if, if you were skilled, you know, in a kind of Beyonce kind of way, that, that you wouldn't be here. You'd be on tour. And, 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 and again, I don't want to take anything away from you, but, you know, and I hope you have those interests and side projects and things that you're really getting into, and that's great. But, but. Education, that's the one thing that you can control, all right? So um, ability, effort, and chance are things like, um, you know, how tall you are, how good looking you are, how, how um, strong you are. Those are kind of the examples I remember giving. Um, I, I, just a real quick anecdote, I don't want to take up too much time, but that when I was, I played baseball for the University of New Mexico, and um, I was, you know, I came out of high school and was like Mr. Big Shot in a little town, you know. And, and I, I thought, oh, I'm, so, I'm unstoppable. And it took me about two days when I played for UNM to realize that, that those guys are bigger and stronger and faster than I'll ever be. You know what I mean? There was a certain, there was this, I'll never forget this guy. I get up to bat, and there was this guy, you know, he's kind of a great player. And I was like, whatever, I'm going to kill this guy. And he had this knuckleball. <laughs> And it was like, son of a, I've never seen anything like that, you know. And it was just, you know, he's just a better player than I was. And it was like, that was kind of a harsh reality to me, you know, that there's really better baseball players than me, which I didn't think until then. Um, let's see, signaling, this is on the exam. Signaling is, is basically, uh, by getting a degree, you show employers that you have the ability to learn. That's all it is. Okay, so, so you... You apply for jobs based, I mean, I guess to a degree it's, it's kind of contingent on the, on the field you're in because like with the nursing degree, that, that really is a lot more application. I mean, certainly you, you have to understand how to do a lot of really uh, specific things. But like a degree in, in say, uh, I don't know, economics or sociology or one of the social sciences, you know, it becomes a lot more um, ambiguous. And so you kind of get this understanding of economics, but then you get into the job as a staff services analyst at, at Cal Fire, and it's, it's like that's where you really learn the job, as I just said. So I got the job at Cal Fire because I had the degree that showed I had the ability to learn. <coughs> so signaling is just, I'm, I got this degree, and I can prove that I can learn this. Um, okay, and then the last one is the superstars, which was um, the Bob Ross, you know, did, 
do we do that? And here we are. Okay, so it's a Bob Ross. So Bob Ross is a painter. And what made him a great painter is not, not he was a good painter. I have no qualm about that. But that he was able to take his skill and translate that, you know, through his decision making and his access to the resource and turn it into a, a public career where we would get up on Sunday mornings and watch Bob Ross. And it was like so relaxing. And the happy little trees. And it was just awesome. And it still is. And I, I still watch him. So, so you guys remember that, right? We did that. Okay. All right. So everybody cool with that? Um, I think that's everything. So let me jump down here and now discrimination. Okay. Discrimination is the act of giving different opportunities to different people based on something they can't control. <clears throat> I'll say that again. I mean, there, here's the official uh, definition of that. So let me say that again. Is giving different opportunities to different people based on characteristics that they can't control. You're doing a lot of pacing. <laughs> Characteristics are things like age, race, <coughs> religious affiliation, um, ethnicity, which Gender. is kind of corollary like race. Um, yeah. yeah. Huge question. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can, but if it's if you're true to your faith, then that's not something you can yeah. control. Yeah. If you're born into it, then it's kind of like. Yeah. You know. You have the option to say no. Then, yeah, you know, you're right. Let, let me, you? let me, I don't know. I'm just a bogeyman. No, I, I know. I know. I, I, I <laughs> That's going to start that. a big conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whether whether you can change your religion or not, like, it still comes down to how you're treated because of your choice or your option, whatever. You know? Yeah, it that's true. It shouldn't change based on, well, you, how you're you do things this way and you do things this way. All right, I, I agree with that. And, and so kind of to put it in perspective is, is especially today, I mean, and, and <coughs> it'll change, you know, it'll be something different in 20 years, but right now, you know, folks that are of the Muslim faith, I think, could be potentially discriminated against because of what's going on in, in you know, the 911 and the, and the Afghanistan-Iraq thing. And, they already um, are. Huh? I would say they already are. Well, yeah, I mean. no doubt, no doubt. And, and you know, 99.999% of Muslim faith people are are good, hard-working, industrious, normal people. You know, they, their religion is a little bit different than some other folks. But it's the, you know, but I think, you know, somebody who's Muslim walks into an airport, and it's almost kind of tongue-in-cheek now, but it's like, oh, oh, oh. But it's really not, you know, well, 99 point, no, 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 no. who cares, right? But but we still have this sort of like, oh, my gosh, somehow 911 and that guy are related, you know, even though really they're not. And they're not even Muslim, they just have darker skin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Also, it's, a, it's the country, you know, uh, we're used to having uh, sun closed on Sunday. But if you've only got a few employees and you can't really spare an employee every Friday, <coughs> full moon, or whatever, you know, you, if they have to take a, a Friday off oh, once a month see. or something yeah. like that, it's going to be difficult on you if you have three. Right. I, I understand. Yeah. What? 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 Sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to. What are you done? Um. I was gonna say too. too it seems like signaling could be uh, negative also instead of positive. Like if, mm -hmm. if you say like if somebody's uh, obese, that just 
just like a college degree would signal an ability and a certain amount of tenacity and resourcefulness, <laughs> uh, obesity <coughs> uh, could signal a, a lack of self-control. Yeah, that's a nice guy. I, I can't answer that. And, and is there discrimination against, so that's kind of a different topic, but I agree with you. But is there discrimination against obese people? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, now that, that's kind of a nice segue into what the next topic is, is that, so, <laughs> just like your colleague here instigated, <laughs> are there jobs that men are better at? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we can eat pizza way faster. <laughs> I, I, I'm <laughs> no, <gonna> you can't. <laughs> All right, so let me, now stop being kind of flip about it. Are there jobs that men are better at? Yes. Example. What are those jobs? Go ahead. There's also jobs that women are better. Oh, for sure, for sure. I'll, I was getting to that. <laughs> we'll start with women then. That's even better. Yeah. All right. So, if, now, now just my own experience, and, and yours is what it is, but um, if I was in a fire and I was unconscious in my house, the last thing in the world I'd want them to do is send in a hundred pound woman to drag my fat ass out. <laughs> because she couldn't do it, you know, and it's not her fault, it's just I'm fat, <laughs> right, okay, so, so I want, I want the, you know, six foot six, 300 pound gorilla to drag me out, because you're going to need that kind of strength to drag my ass out, <laughs> right, okay, so there's that, now women, are there jobs that women are better at? Yeah, tell nursing, me. a nursing for the most part. Nursing, um, tell me why. Because women are better nurturers. We're, yeah, we're nurturers. Okay, so, so you argue that, that women are better at nursing because they're nurturing. That's just more like in our nature. In our okay. Men okay. tend to be a little bit more clinical, for lack clinical? of Clinical? Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, this is the way it is. They're for the most part, there are some exceptions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Would you rather have a 100-pound person like nurse or a 300-pound nurse? Say that again. I kind of missed it. Say it again. Would you like, like a big, muscly nurse? Like, 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 like a nurse is better, like... I'd rather have a woman nurse just saying. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. way, way to first go. Sponge way bass, to first sponge bass and all that kind of thing. If you're, you're going to get a shot, I think kind of like what you are saying. If you're going to get like shots or something, you have like a nice delicate little female in there, or you have like this big aggressive man in there. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Up on up, not, not, three weeks ago, I went in and I got a massage, and, and this, and I was like, dude, um, this this person who was doing the massage, she comes out and she says, do you want you want something you know, a little more deep tissue or just you know whatever? I was like, oh yeah, definitely deep tissue. <laughs> and out comes this guy, and it was like, crap. <laughs> but it was an awesome massage. Oh yeah, he yeah. was sore. I mean, he did a great job, you know. But it was like, if I'd have known it was a guy, I'd have said, oh, just delicate. <laughs> you know, crazy. Okay, uh, there was some. See, but that's not based on ability, though. That's based on the fact that you don't want to be naked in front of a dude. Uh, well, uh, first of all, let me clarify, I wasn't naked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me just point out. <laughs> really wants to wear the tights. <laughs> what do you guys think? Was was he being discriminated against? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he no, was not no. being... No, no. 
restaurant though if the, the whole theme is boobs so unless you've got a C yeah, cup like you're not gonna smart. get a job there it's if they had a like a yellow brick road restaurant where all they have is like short people serving you if you're six foot two you're not gonna get a job there <laughs> you know what I mean it's a, it's a theme restaurant it's a theme restaurant it's a theme restaurant and another thing like, like you're saying though like as far as gender and stuff like that and um, not even just gender, like I worked at Chevy's and SAC and up here, and I did marketing. And they they want a particular look to go out and do marketing. They don't want, you know, some sloppy, just one of their normal servers just sloppy going out there and marketing the restaurant. They want someone that can pull themselves together, look professional, clean, right. nice neat, smile. and a nice presentable yeah. person, you know. No, a guy, a, a guy very well could have. My manager went with me. But, but what you're saying is, is a certain... I wasn't saying that, gender yeah. with that, but I'm right. just saying but as far as presence, yeah. 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 Um, over here in the back. Could it technically be like a, like a strip club? Like when a guy applied to a like strip club, that's only like female you know, strippers? Yep. They wouldn't be like, like yeah, yeah. That's opening up the market. Like, no, guys don't... <laughs> like the what? Okay, so you, you, actually, just, you actually just answered the... Well, let me get right back to that. Go ahead. Well, um, like, what's that restaurant or that uh, clothing store that hires dudes that walk around shirtless? Oh, uh, Hollister, Abercrombie. Abercrombie. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, a chick applies there. Like, the uniform doesn't exactly. They have their own. No, they have their own. They have their own. Okay. So back to, and I, I, I know I'm kind of skimming over a lot of stuff here, but let me kind of tell you the result and then why. And, and your colleagues sort of already answered this. Is that the guy didn't get the job? He sues. He sues. He sues, <laughs> he goes to court, and he loses. And the reason is they because... They have other jobs there for him. They're just not sufficient. Well, but he, he wanted to be a server, right? And, and uh, yeah, he could do other jobs for sure. But he loses, and the reason, the logic was because Hooter's business model isn't hiding anything. They're, they're hiring a certain kind of person, but they're not, they're not keeping it um, secretive why they're doing it. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and that made it okay as long as as long as everybody understands. If you want a job at Hooters, these are the qualifications. Just like me as a teacher, you got to have blah blah blah, whatever. Just the same thing there. As long as they don't keep it secretive, and they don't say, "Oh, well, we're not hiring you because uh, you know we're just not hiring anymore." You know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And and so they were successful in defending it because their business model said, "We hire this kind of person," just the same as. Shasta College hires a, a, a person with this kind of a degree or whatever. And, and so they win. Now, that leads me to the next thing is that, so where does discrimination come from? Now, and, and just kind of play along here. And, I, and you guys all know what I'm talking about. If you need to clarify, just tell me. And I, I don't want to make this seem funny or light or anything, but, but I want to make something clear. Is that, now let's say that I am a business owner, a restaurant here. Okay, I have a burger. And I have some personal preference where I, you know, just because that's how I am, I only hire people with blue hair. That's all I do. It's a smoke right? restaurant. Naturally blue hair. Oh. oh, great. I get to hire my mom. <laughs> 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 just, kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just going to kill me if I do Okay. Blue is, let's say purple, because uh, blue hair potentially could happen. <laughs> okay, so I only hire people with purple hair. Okay, that's just because I have some preference. Now, on my applications, I don't say you have to have blue hair. I just I put it out there and I say, okay, I'm hiring people, but somebody comes in with green hair and I just sort of eat because I'm not hiring those kinds of people. You see what I'm saying? Okay, now, what am I, as, as a, well, I'm a restaurateur, as a burger place, and I'm hiring people with purple hair. Does that create a problem for me? Because even if I'm successful in hiring just people with purple hair, now what do I have as a staff? I have a bunch of people with purple hair. Now, people who come to my restaurant, what are they looking for? 
they're looking to be served or cooked or whatever, you know, that their service is by people with just purple hair. Okay, so far so good? If I'm now in another restaurant, and I don't give, I don't care about the color hair, what I'm looking for is, I have a burger place, I want people who know how to cook, and people who are good servers, and people who are, and I don't care about those other characteristics. What I'm looking for is, is the qualities of their workability. So I hire people with green hair, purple hair, pink hair, and I don't care, okay, but I hire people that are good at their jobs. Do I have an advantage over the company that hires just people with purple hair? Yeah. yeah. I do. And so I have an, a kind of what happens is the, the companies that hire people irrespective of their traits but that are good at their job tend to outperform the companies that hire with those kind of discriminatory preferences. So, so discriminatory firms tend not to be as profitable, which leads me to my next point. I saw a hand. Was that? Or are you just... Oh, I was just going to say like Exactly. Now, now, so what is that? Now, which leads me to kind of the next step is who, who's really propagating the discrimination? Right, right, absolutely correct. And so, so if I have a restaurant where all I have hired here is people with purple hair, because I'm, I'm, I have some discriminatory preference as a, as a hiring manager and owner. Okay, now the people who come to my restaurant can expect to see servers and cooks, yada, 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 people with purple hair, right? But what are they not getting is good, necessarily good servers or good cooking or good, you know, blah, 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 right? So that company over there that hires people with skill tends to outperform me because they make better burgers and they're faster service, blah, blah, blah. So what keeps this restaurant open? The people who are patronizing us. Exactly. So where does the discrimination come from? It's not the hiring necessarily, people who support but the it. people who come to my restaurant are willing to pay more money for less effective service. So actually, Which think is about why this, says so is that discrimination <laughs> is actually paid for and fueled by the customer. And if you don't like Hooters, as an example, they're, they're not, I'm not saying they're discriminated, they, they have a business model, but if you choose not to go into a restaurant that has those type servers, whatever they are, you don't go to that restaurant, that's, that's the loudest voice you can have to be anti what they're trying to promote. Does that make sense? Just don't go. And then eventually you go get a burger at their neighbor's who serves a better burger anyway because they hired the skilled workers, not the purple hair workers, and it sort of forces the discriminatory company out of business. So slowly but surely, yeah. Can't that be kind of exemplified by the whole Chick-fil-A thing when the president of Chick-fil-A you know, said that he was against gay marriage? Some people just quit going to Chick-fil-A. Totally. And then That's some a great example. Yeah, and so gay, gay marriage. Who cares, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not saying, you know, that I don't want to hear. Let me, let me rephrase this. Don't want to hear I know we all have right an opinion, now. and I'm not trying to diminish or promote anybody's opinion, but this guy's out of line because what his job is is to serve Food. good sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Don't care what your political preference is. Exactly. And, and if, if you want to try to impose that on me, guess what? I'm not going to patronize. There's you. a store right next door to yours. I'll get a, I'll get a, you know, Popeye's a hamburger. <laughs> yeah, um, back there and then up here. He didn't, he didn't even say that I'm against gay marriage, though. He said I believe in traditional marriage. Okay. Which yeah. He I, insinuate. Uh huh. You put words in his mouth that that means that he doesn't believe in gay marriage, but that's not what he said. He said he just was pro traditional marriage. He just say? said all he said was I believe in traditional marriage. Okay. Yeah. And I. I could be. I, you might be right. I'm sure you are. But I, I yeah, I had heard a little something about it. But yeah. if you interpret that, and, and I'm not saying you do or don't, but if if somebody says I only hire purple hair people, eh, I don't care because I'm going to go someplace with good service. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's places that promote <clears throat> gay marriage. Others like only does like gay pride shirts and Target says they promote it. Yeah. There's a lot of people.
right. either side, it's just like the yeah. carrot. Who cares? Gay right. marriage doesn't affect the taste of the chicken. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm here for a chicken sandwich. I don't <laughs> exactly. really care. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, I saw a hand over here. Uh, or, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, I was gonna say something that seems like it's just a matter of an economic vote. People make their totally. economic votes. And yep. And then, and then the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that the, <coughs> the, the, I don't know how we'd be careful here, but is that, that the people who worry about the quality of the product and the companies that worry about the quality of the product and not worry about the gay marriage and the, you know, that other, other things that we can't control, they tend to be more successful. Because people go there because the product is higher quality. It's not any other secret reason, you know? All right, go ahead. What about putting the shoe on the other foot, where the, the, where the um, instead of the person hiring, it's the customers they allow, like an all men's club? Again, that's, that's you, you support it with your pocketbook. As long as their business model is, is forthcoming about why they hire, who they hire. And, and, and then you have a choice as a consumer, right? And, and if you want to go to a gentleman's club, what, you're not there. You're getting what you're paying for. You see what I'm saying? You're not, there's no misconception. That's where the line is drawn, is that as long as, as, long as their business model is up front, then, then they, they do what they do, and they, their patrons are who they are, and they're getting what they're paying for. But when you become secretive about it, then you lose a, a, a competitive edge. Because now you're hiring people because of some characteristic, or not, or not hiring them because, and now you're hiring people who aren't necessarily good at what they do. They're just being hired because of what they, you know, who they look like, or what, you know, whatever characteristics they have, right? Does that make sense? Uh, well, you see those pictures, you know, online where you see the guy that's covered in tattoos. You know, this is him on Monday, and then the next picture you see, he's in a white that's lab coat with right. a stethoscope on, and he's the doctor that's like the heart surgeon that saved your mom's life. Right. You know, right, so right. discriminating against people for those type of things is, I mean, yeah. getting to the point now, when I, I used to work at um, Cinemark 10 years ago, and they wouldn't allow people with stretched earlobes. You had to wear, uh, like, a Band-Aid over flesh your ears. Color, you had to take flesh, it out. Flesh yeah, yeah. Band-Aid? Like a, to cover it because yeah. if you took the earrings out, it looked you know pretty yeah. gnarly. You got this black thing yeah, on. exactly. Yeah. And I had a friend there who had you know like inch and a half gauged ears, and he had to take them out and put <coughs> band aids on them. And now like they don't care as much because not very many people want to work at Cinemark, so they have to like okay, well we'll open up our. <laughs> we're we're changing our standards. Well, yeah, exactly because it opens up their ability to hire. Yeah, good point. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say. I mean, when people look at somebody and they discriminate against them, they're judging them. Something like, they don't know. Who Make has, the like, older fashion standards to use, like, a young lady or young man with, like, covered in tattoos, they're like, holy crap, like, in jet, like, They must be a biker. That's right. not what they're used to. That's not their norm. That's <laughs> right. not what they grew up seeing. Although, that's what we're all used to seeing, right. and we don't think it's weird. Totally. I mean, and then, that's yeah. That's unique for everybody else. Totally. That, I think that's what he was trying to say. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I think, sound right? I, I agree with that. And, and now it's like, I, I don't know, something like, I read somewhere, it's like one in two people now has a tattoo. Something, something along those lines. And, and, you know, 50 years ago, if you got a tattoo, it was like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Did you, somebody up there? No. Okay, so let me kind of recap that real fast. So you have, basically, discrimination is, is fueled by the consumer. Okay, that's the point. The, the companies let them, you know, if they want to discriminate, that's their problem because they're not going to have a competitive edge. And they eventually get sort of forced out by the companies that hire the talented workers. That's the point. And you and I, we're the real powerhouses here. We're the ones that go to places. If, if you want to go to a place with only purple-haired servers, be my guest, but be ready to have a mediocre server with purple hair. That's the fact. If you want good service, go to this other place who hires people based on their ability to serve. You see what I mean?
That's, and, and who gives a crap about what color hair there is? Does that make sense? Everybody kind of okay with that? All right, um, da, da, da. so let me go through. Is there any questions about that? I covered a lot of material there, but I, the point is about the consumer. Um, and lastly, just real fast, income and poverty, just a couple of quick little things on the call. How much inequality? What are the problems in measuring? And I'll, I'll just kind of fly through this. You don't need to write this list down. Um, here's how, if you were to take our economy and break it up into percentages, um, this is about how, this says 03, but it's actually 06, but it's kind of how our, our economy breaks down. Um, imagine that you lined up all the families in the, in the United States. Um, and then what, what this says is that there's, in the early part of the century, or, or 1935s, there was a big gap between those who had and those that didn't. The gap was pretty wide. And then as we went through World War II and into the 50s, the gap got smaller. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, the ethic, the work ethic in the United States, my parents, is that the trick to success is hard work. I mean, not that that's changed, but it was more literal then. And you could get a job at a factory and, and spend your whole career there and work your way up and become a manager, blah, blah, blah. And it was really possible to stay with your job your whole life, and hard work paid off. And so as we go into the 50s, the, the discrepancy. 
discrepancy between the rich and the poor got closer together because people who were poor could work their way up. Then as we go into the 80s, it starts to widen back out. And the reason for that is because technology changed the distribution in this country because it became now the people who have the technological side and the people who don't. And you guys are all on this side of it, so there's nothing to worry about there. You guys are all computer savvy and stuff. But, you know, 10 years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so what happened was it, it started to widen apart because, um, you know, there were the people who had the ability to move ahead with their careers in terms of technology, and there were those that were stuck. You know, they were always going to be kind of low-end management in a firm that had no technology. Um, and I, I don't know, it's hard to predict how that will look, because in, in 20 years, you know, everybody's going to have that basis. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Um, this is just kind of fun and games with numbers, just how the um, countries break up and the distribution of wealth. Um, this, let me make this big. This is on the exam. Um, this is just how, how um, countries are, are, how their wealth, how equitably their wealth is um, divided up amongst the nation. And you can see that Japan is very much more close. And I'll tell you why I think that is in a second. And then a country like South Africa, which is, you know, kind of on the tail end of apartheid still. You know, I mean, it's, it's done, but it's taken a while to grow out of that. So in South Africa, there was this big division between the, you know, those who had and those that didn't. Um, in Japan, it's much closer. Anybody want to take a shot at that? why? Take a guess. More people. Say it again. She said more, more, just more population. Mm -hmm. Maybe to a degree, yeah. Go ahead. So are there other workers and technology? The workers and yeah. technology? So are there workers and their technology? Okay. Work, yeah, just their, their workers and their technology. Okay. How they're, yeah. raised, how they're raised? How they're raised? I think, yeah, you're getting warmer. More people get education? Yeah, you're getting even warmer, I think. <laughs> I think, I think, and I, I don't, I mean, it's kind of a combination of things, but I think. Probably partly in Japan, the reason that the, the wealth isn't um, as spread out is because in Japan, families don't, probably because the nation is so small, but they don't leave the nest. They've got generations of families living together. And so when, when somebody gets older and retires, their, their income doesn't drop significantly because the family unit is still together. And so you have a, a family that has, you know, a son, a grandson, um, even a great-grandson. So you have a baby that's not in poverty. You have a, a, a son who's working or a daughter who's working, making decent money, and that's contributing to the family income of a retired person. Does that make sense? So the families aren't separated. In, in the United States, you ask, you know, you look at my grandmother, who, who's not with us anymore, but, but at the time, her, you know, she had retirement, but her income was very, very low. And if you looked at her total household income, it was next to nothing, and she fell below some line of poverty, for sure. You see what I'm saying? But in, in Japan, the families don't separate, and so if you looked at grandmother, you know, her, her son or daughter is earning money, so it looks like the household is still generating revenue, which is true. I mean, does that make sense? So, so the family doesn't separate, so family income is more um, together. The question on the exam is, where does the United States fall in the distribution of wealth? And the answer is about it.
Everybody good? Alright, moving along. Okay, poverty rate and poverty line. Just a real kind of subtle dis uh, distinction here. Um, the poverty rate and the poverty line. The poverty rate is a percentage of people who fall below the poverty line. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, it seems funnier in my head. Okay. <laughs> the poverty rate is the percentage of people who fall below a certain income. Percentage of our population of, of the United States, or whatever, that, that fall below some some threshold of income. Okay, and the poverty line is what that threshold is. And so, in the United States, for a family of four, it's like twenty. It's twenty-four something, I think, right now. And it goes up with inflation, of course. But it, it's about twenty-four thousand. And for a single person, it's eighteen thousand, which gives rise to the minimum wage. And I could talk a lot more about that as an intro to macro for some of you, but I won't. So, okay, the poverty rate is the percentage of people that fall below some threshold of income. The poverty line is that, that sustenance diet times three for a family of four or for an individual. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump ahead one more time. These are all obviously on the uh, PowerPoint. Everybody got this, more or less? So, it, so the poverty rate just statistically hasn't changed much over the last um, 70 years. Um, economic poverty rate, poverty rate. It's, it's, what it says is that even though the incomes of the impoverished have gone up, so is the rate of inflation. So it hasn't had, the, it's pretty stable. Um, this just shows kind of the breakdown. Um, not really particularly interested in that right now. Um, three facts about poverty. Just, just re don't write this down. Just to just uh, say it. Um, there, it's correlated with race. You know, minorities tend to be more three times more likely to live under the poverty line. Correlated with age. Um, who do you think is most likely to be impoverished? Sixty-five yeah. and up. Sixty-five and up. Children. No, Children. College students, young adults, actually the answer is children. And the reason children is is because old people, elderly, <laughs> senior citizens. I'm on my way. First step of the You know what? I had some smart ass point out yesterday. That we were in class yesterday and somebody said, Oh, it's 12 12. This is the only time in your life you'll ever see 12 12. And somebody points out in class and says, you know, every date's the first time you've ever seen that date. It's like, good point. <laughs> you got that. Good point there. <laughs> the elderly, um, they have no income, but they're living on retirements and Social Security. And so they have, they, they don't, they're not making any money, so it looks like they're under some poverty line, but they have retirement. So, so the, the most likely to live under the poverty line are children. And the reason for that is because if you have a family of four and the, you know, the, the parents aren't able to provide for their children, then you have two people in the world that are, are generating zero revenue, zero uh, income, and there's no way for them to escape it. They can't go say, well, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go work for myself. They can't get, so it's, it's an it's a issue of the poverty rate being exacerbated by the number of children. Does that make sense? So, so you might have one impoverished parent, but then as a function of that, you'll have two or three impoverished children, and they can't get away from it. So, exam, the, the most common group um, to be uh, in, affected by poverty is children. Yeah. Um, is it, it's, uh, poverty is correlated with family composition, and by far, by far, the most likely family composition to be impoverished is? Single mothers. Single mothers, you got it. 
38% in California. What is or it? 38% in Shasta County oh right gosh. now. Wow, that's, that's... Which is twice the... Right now there's, um, like, I think it's about 13%. No, not 13%. 15.5% in Shasta County yeah. are impoverished. 38.4%. I just did a project on this. 38.4% of that, 15%, is single mothers. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so everybody get that? The most... Blood Family composition, single mothers. Yes, sir. Is that all the single mothers? Not single, mothers? <laughs> uh, single fathers, you know, um, I, I looked for that a couple years ago, and the data is pretty, it's, it's obtuse. It's hard to find. And, and I, I looked and looked and looked. And there is some things out there that says it's a definitely an issue, but, but nothing, nothing really concrete. Definitely a lot more about single uh, mothers, for sure. And I've kind of been watching that over the years, but it's just nothing's ever really come around about that, you know, and I acknowledge it's there, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, fathers have a, a, a lot more ability to lead, you know, whereas mothers are, are you know, they, they don't. Yeah, 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 I mean, there, there's probably lots of reasons, but, but fathers, obviously, you know. Yeah. Okay, um, so, let's see, uh, da, 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 okay, uh, let me see if I need to do this, I think I will skip this. Okay, and then real fast here, this is just ways of dealing with poverty. Um, and I'm going to skip through that. You can look it up if you need it. Okay, and then there's three political philosophies about redistributing income. Political, economic philosophies. And um, I'll just go through these really fast. I'm sorry. When did they do child labor laws? Um, in the 20s, somewhere there. Yeah, that, that was, was kind of yeah, after World War I. It was, because they had kids, they were pulling kids out of the coal mines in, in the 20s, I know. Um, and the only reason I kind of know that is because they're, they were comparing um, some of the labor laws in China to the labor laws in the United States, and they said that China is about in the 1920s in terms of their laws with respect to children. So about 1920s, maybe a little bit the 30s. Okay, um, just real fast, let me kind of explain each of these and which which is which. Um, utilitarianism. Uh, there's a lot of text here, but look, just write down the important parts here. How am I doing? 31. 31. 31. Yeah. Okay. So number one, um, utilitarianism is the political philosophy that utility should be distributed in this nation in an equitable way, and it's all about utility. And let me give you the uh, anecdote. If you took if you took a hundred dollars from me and gave it to some impoverished person, how, how, or from you, let's say you take a hundred dollars from you, okay? The tax structure says we're taking a hundred dollars and we're going to give it to somebody who's impoverished. Do you, does that bother you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like that. I mean, that's a lot of money. I don't know about you, but to me, 100 bucks is a fair amount of money. I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, it's nothing to scoff at, you know? And so what, what happens is if you took 100 from me and gave it to somebody who's impoverished, that would, that would hurt me. But if you took $100 from Oprah or from, from you know, Donald Trump, whoever, is, and you took that hundred dollars and you gave it to somebody who's impoverished, do they care? No. Do they even notice? No. You know, hundred dollars to them is like nothing, you know, it's just a drop, it's nothing. And, and so the idea is that if you take money from people who have lots of it, the disutility that they experience is very little compared to the utility that the impoverished person will get by receiving it. And the idea is to try to kind of equalize the utility in your um, economy. Does that make sense? Can you say that again? Okay, so if you take $100 from somebody who's got lots and lots and lots of money, they don't care. Their utility, their disutility is very, very small. And then the utility that, of the person that you give it to is very, very high. And so, so you're trying to balance the utility out. Is that like a tax that we're talking about? Yeah, basically. Yeah, it's a yeah, redistribution of wealth. Exactly. So that'd be like a flat tax? Or what is um, it, well, it depends what you're... Yeah, it's not necessarily. I mean, it's just... A, it, it is a, that's how they do it, is a tax. Okay, so utilitarianism is about utility, okay? It's about equalizing the utility. 
The next one is liberalism, which is, this is kind of like the Democrats. It's not, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that they're all liberals, but, you know, kind of, maybe. Um, so liberalism, all this is saying is that our laws of political redistrib uh, wealth redistribution should be driven by what they call veils of ignorance, and let me kind of explain that. If I'm a lawmaker, I want to devise a law to redistribute income that if I was part of that redistribution that, like, for some reason I lose everything, that I'll be okay. So, so they make this, this, this system that it doesn't matter who you're talking about. That if I lose everything in my economy and I lose it all, that there's a system here that will protect me. Okay? So it's just enough. So let me back up. That the lawmakers are, are making the laws with blinders on. They don't think about special interests or anything. It's all about protecting the least wealthy in our economy. Okay? Does that make sense? And so, so the laws aren't driven by special interests at all. It's all about protecting the least able to protect themselves in our economy. And this kind of correlates with the Democrats, kind of. And the last one... which are the Republicans. And the last one is um, liber oh, liberalism. Uh, okay, libertarianism. All this, this is the Republicans, and they say that the only reason wealth is to be protected, and I'm the one that will, as the wealthy person, I decide where my wealth gets redistributed. I I buy what I want. I do the things I want to do. I hire the people I want to hire, and the redistribution of wealth is all about my needs. So I, if I want to buy a new car, then I'll employ a new mechanic. You know what I'm saying? And th those decisions are my decisions, not the government's. Okay, so libertarianism is Republican-ish, and it says, I choose. And the only reason for laws in this country is to protect my wealth. Does that make sense? So, so the only laws is that my wealth is to be left alone, I decide how it gets redistributed by hiring and firing and buying and doing the things I want to do. And that, that causes the wealth you know, permeation. And the only reason for laws in this country is to protect me from somebody who wants to take my money away from me. Make sense?